One, two. Iona, are you ready? Brilliant. Hopefully. Is it working? Good. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so, obviously, it's a new term. We had Steam Week last week, which was a bit of a disruption for Level 5 and doing something different. But uh, this is the first week of everyone being back together and um, the first cultural maneuvers of this term. And um, we thought we'd start as we sort of mean to go on, really. And I guess for a long time, we've wanted to get more students involved with presentation and actually being involved with running the event. Um, so we've obviously got the cameras and all that stuff kind of working. We tested that extensively during Detour, and that worked really well. But we also want the, the actual presentations and the content to be more led by students, not exclusively, but a lot more. So um, yeah, so we've got the, the, the first week. We thought, why not start off um, with a student project? And um, we've got two level six students who've been working on a, a, a sort of a, a project for a, for a number of weeks, uh, for a number of uh, months, sorry. And uh, they're going to talk about that project. And um, yeah, I'll uh, let Antigone introduce them. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And yes, Dan said we're going to be in this room from one to three every week. So after your mental wealth modules, you can take you know, a break for lunch and then come and join us. Some exciting uh, people coming. And I think we show you that some exciting things happening already today with Dominica, who is a level six um, graphic design student, and Louisa, who is level six photography student. And they're gonna be talking to you about a community-based project they developed in Carpenter's Estate in Stratford. I'll let them talk more about it. What I wanted just to say is that this started last, um, last academic year, in fact, in the spring, when uh, Rob Pycroft who was a moment ago in the room, and myself, were running a module called Research into Practice for Photography. I'm sure you all have a similar module in your studies. And um, these two women who have an organization called Frames of Mind, their, name, um, their names are Zoe Flynn and Bo Chapman, got in touch and they said, we want some students photographers to work with us in a uh, community-based project around Carpenter's Estate in Stratford. Um, we, you know, opened the call to the students. There were a, a bunch of students along with Rob who went to, um, for a field trip, met the people on the ground. Louisa was one of them. And Louisa kind of, while other people didn't commit it, Louisa committed and we gave a shout to graphic design students for the graphic designer, one was Dominica came along. And um, the two of them really persevered and, and kind of kept on working for months. So it all started late spring last year. And only a couple of weeks ago, the uh, photographic supporting wall that they were working on was revealed in Stratford. And so it is a great pleasure that today I'm going to uh, introduce both of them to you. And they're going to be talking about this experience. And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So please give them a big applause of welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now, before we start in explaining our project, we're going to show you a video so that it gives you a bit of context. The Olympics is dying down. Attention is shifting to the question of legacy. After all, London's bid for the Games was won on some pretty big promises about the regeneration of one of the most deprived areas of the country. But to what degree will the transformation of London's East End benefit local people, some of whom were moved out to make way for the Olympic Park? Well, now there are plans in the shadow of the stadium to knock down a housing estate to make way for a new university campus. Aisha Baksh has the story. 
Lying in the shadow of the Olympic Stadium is the Carpenter's Estate. This place has been home to hundreds of London families over the last 40 years. But since 2005, the area has undergone a remarkable transformation. We was going to have everything, weren't we? The Olympics? Westfields? Come on! But the growing appeal of Stratford has attracted the interest of UCL, a large university looking to create a new campus in the East End. The proposal on the table is for the University College London to build a new state-of-the-art campus here. If it gets the green light, it means these homes and gardens will be replaced by lecture halls and laboratories. Unbelievable. Couldn't believe that they were going to force me out of my home to, to build a university. The reactions was a disappointment, obviously a very deep disappointment. Um, anger and also... Um, uncertainty. Walking through the Carpenter's estate, it's hard not to miss the boarded up windows and abandoned houses. Joe Alexander is a resident and is leading a campaign to save the estate. It's depressing for some people, it's, um, you know, it's demoralising, especially with the decant going on and um, having the community dismantled uh, in front of your eyes. The elected mayor of Newham believes UCL's bid is an opportunity for the entire borough, in particular the next generation. They're one of the half dozen best universities in the world. Now the idea that we can bring that sort of talent, that sort of skill, that sort of aspiration to our young people in Newham has got to be important to us. Um, so that, that will continue. But when UCL first presented the plan to the residents in September, they got a rough reception. Trains and the buses and the shops, and we've all got to be pushed off. We're not interested in what you're going to do. Well, I understand the, the strong feelings, but this is the site that, that meets our needs, and we're only looking at it. We're only Eventually, Mary got her chance to tell UCL what she thought. Thank you. I would like to say to you, CL, if you honestly think that I'm going to give my home up to you or anybody else at my time of life, forget it. I will fight you. You will have to drag me out. It is mine. It belongs to me. But clearly speaking out took an emotional toll. I get too upset when I'm told, because this is, this, this is my life, really, isn't it? He's winning the race and I'm losing. After the meeting, we caught up with Mary, a former teaching assistant at the local school, and her husband, Brian. They bought their three-bedroom home back in the 80s under the Thatcher government's right to buy scheme. I've lived here 42 years, moved in with two children, Susan and Brian. I loved working in the school with kids. It's brilliant. And my youngest daughter ended up being a teacher in the school. I became very ill in March, and I needed friends and neighbours, and they'd been really good. And Dolores, well, if I'm not around for a day or two, Dolores will knock to make sure I'm fine. Hi, Mary. Hello. Here we are. Come on. Come in. Mary's great fun. We've known each other now for 26 years. She was the first one I met, so I think she was a bit nosy. <laughs> She knocked on the back door. Uh, it was like about the same day that we moved in. And she sort of said, hello, I'm Mary from next door. That's all right. Like Mary, Dolores also owns her own home. So the council has said they will buy their properties at 110% of the market rate. However, neither of them think this money would buy them an equivalent property in upcoming Stratford. I would literally have to move out to get somewhere and to get somewhere decent. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Reverend David Richards is the local vicar and a fierce defender of the community that lives within the Carpenter's estate. The police say that this community has a very low crime rate. It's a place where people feel safe and are safe. It's a place where people talk to their neighbours. UCL don't need to demolish these properties to build a, a, a new development. I think the moral balance is such a difficult one, and, and I really do. But I think that, um, on the one hand, uh, for UCL to establish a presence in, in Stratford is, is a remarkable thing, uh, which can help, I think, advance not just the financial fortunes of that community, but also uh, social benefits. 
Around 500 residents remain on the estate and half are council tenants. Eileen and Andy have rented their home from the council for the last 15 years. They fear being moved away will severely disrupt family life. Obviously, if you've got kids and you've got grandchildren, you don't want to be miles and miles away from them. What Eileen and other tenants were promised was the chance to return to the area once new accommodation was in place. But UCL have not said how much affordable housing, if any, will be set aside for tenants. A home loss payment, which is a fixed... Tony Bird is an independent advisor who's been employed by Newham Council to help the residents. He's worked on dozens of regeneration schemes. It's quite unique in my view because this is the first time that I've ever come across a regeneration where they are removing the entire community without making any new build provision replacement on the site. Now, when I first spoke to Newham's elected mayor about this back in January, he promised a right to return for all residents. We will listen to people trying to stay together and keep communities together. As I said, we promise that people can go back if they want. But when I asked him again some months later, the situation was somewhat less clear. I can only say we'll do the best so we can with what we've got. No, well, an empty You can't promise. deliver on your promise. I've said as best we can. What, what can I say other than that we'll have property, there'll be some, and we'll then say, well, if you want it, you can have that. By the way, they can move just across the road because there's council housing just across the high street, it's not for high street. And there's council housing just at the other side of the Olympic Park, right around the Olympic Park. So, as it's 70 per cent of people have stayed in the area. Residents such as Eileen, however, remain deeply sceptical. What I would say to Robin Wells is that um, he shouldn't make promises he can't keep, or he has no intention of keeping. On a cold evening in October, Newham Council's Cabinet met in East Ham to decide whether or not to accept UCL's initial plans. Mary and the others weren't able to see the decision being made in person, but they still managed to make themselves heard. UCL! It took just 45 minutes for the decision to be made. The mayor guided the cabinet to accept UCL's initial plans. The estate moved one step closer to demolition. My hopes for the future remaining here in my home, living here in a community that I've grown to love. Uh, my hope for the future would be that UCL will change their mind. <laughs> 42 years and they want me to give it up. Come on. Go out fighting, you bet I will. Thank you. So, before we go back to this problem, which is about the effect of gentrification had on structures, um, we're going to explain briefly the um, briefly the area and the history of the area. So. In terms of, um, thank you. So as you can see there in the map, um, Carpenter Estate is the red highlighted area. And it's really close to the Olympic Park and the stadium, really famous area that we all know. In terms of the history and how it took its name, well, the, um, the area was basically bought in 1767 by a carpenter's company, which bought 63 um, basically acres of farmland that was near West Ham. So the purpose of uh, buying this land was basically to build factories and uh, to make homes for all the people that were actually working in these factories. Also, they focused on building, let's say, a quality, a better quality of life for those people. So they built a school, they built a pub, they built um, a crafting center, as well as community spaces. So the wide variety of factories, there, was, there were actually a wide variety of factories, from paint factories, as well as gunpowder, butchers. So all the area was actually quite smoky, and those factories were actually putting the waste inside the soil and in, on the canal. So the area was pretty much quite polluted. Now, the area at the time was called the Road of Thousand Smells. This is because basically what residents were describing is they could be, they could be everywhere in the, area, in the area with their eyes closed and they would be able to understand exactly where they were just by the smell. 
And also it's important to note that even though the area was quite polluted, um, there was like, we provided thousands of jobs actually for people because it was literally the industrial side of London. So previously um, it was completely empty. There was no jobs. And even though it was polluted, at least um, there was kind of improvement in the, kind, in the quality of life. This is one of the factory that actually it's still standing, even though they changed site. So the picture on the left is actually how it looked like, and the picture on the right is what it is still now. So it's been rebuilt. Um, this factory actually was the only one that actually wasn't smelling that bad because it was producing cosmetics. So the girls who were working there, of course, were all women. They were called the lavender girls because they were always good smelling and uh, nice makeup. And it was a nice story. We found an article about um, those still alive, two girls, two women still alive that we tried to contact, but we weren't lucky enough to, to have an interview, but we'll keep trying. So this is the area actually how it looked like in 1920, as you can see, pretty much still around the farmland, but in the center of the image, you can see those were all the factories that they were still going all the way down to River Lee. And on the top left, you can see that those low uh, low-rising houses, they were actually where the employees were actually living. This is an image uh, just after the Second World War. So Stratford at this time was actually a constant target of air raids. So majority of the state was completely devastated by the war. And, uh, you know, as you can see, few, few uh, of the buildings actually stayed, few factories stayed. And uh, it is important for the next stage to understand that basically what happened is just before, just before the, uh, the, the, the state, the current state was actually rebuilt, London was already going through a massive stage of changes. Here explains that the uh, state was rebuilt in 1967 and it was combining low rise housing as well as three tower blocks, which is Denison Point, James Lee Point, and Land Point. Now, at this point, Newham um, bought the old estate, so it's currently the owner of the estate. And as I just said in the previous slide, this is important because in, this is the time in which London just went through a massive change. So this is the time in which many of those uh, tower blocks started to appear in the London la landscape. And this is because there was this uh, utopian dream as they were advertising, which consisted in demolishing the previous um, communities, putting up those like really tall structures and putting all the poor people together and kind of stuck them in the structure and keep them isolated. Uh, of course, as I said, this was um, advertised as actually a better way of life, a better way of living. And uh, in the case of Stratford, um, it was a bit easier for the simple fact the, with the damaging that it was done by the Second World War, the process was much, much smoother. So majority of the buildings were already disappeared. In other, in, in other communities instead, they literally had to destroy communities in order to build those buildings. Now, many uh, people that have been through the um, you know, demolishing of, of their own community in other areas of London were not really happy about the change because they, by having their own home, even though it wasn't the best condition, I mean, the, those estates were really poor. The houses were really in bad conditions they would have preferred having those houses restored and still keep their individuality of I'm having my own house as I want it, as well as keeping their own community rather than being put into box and containers and living stuck, stuck together with people they don't know. And pretty much it's more isolating than it looks like for the simple fact that you don't know who you're living with, you don't know the, the person next door, the children don't have uh, literally places where to go, so they were just pouring in the street, and majority of the time they were dam damaging um, the places just out of boredom, basically. 
But in the case of Stratford, it was, was much better in a way, because exactly, there was no community to begin with, everything was destroyed. So when actually they build those places, they put new people in there, people actually managed to um, build a community. So there was a really strong sense of community that we tracked back till uh, Denison Point and the other two blocks were actually built. So we have here two pictures that we took from the uh, New York archives. This is Lang Point, just on the right side being constructed, and Denison Point on the left side being constructed. Now we have another video here of a resident of Carpenter Estate that actually describes her life on the estate. We first moved to the Carpenter's estate when I was 11. That was mum, dad, uh, and my brother, myself, and my mum's brother, who was four of us. We moved into a terraced house. And then the war, of course, um, damaged a lot of the property. They decided that it was uninhabitable. So they decided then that the estate would have to be demolished. When the flats were built first, we were all moved into the flats. And that's where we've been ever since. My mum was alive when they started changing this estate, building it, right? And um, she was so, ex well, we were, we were so excited to think that we would be moving and we would have a bathroom. We were more or less told that we had to come in here, right? Unfortunately, my mum died before we moved in here. Um, so I moved in here with my dad, and he lived for about two years, and then he died. The flat was lovely. I mean, it, we really did love it. I mean, um, <laughs> for a start, we had even walls, which in the old houses with the bomb damage, all the walls, I mean, we had some walls with big bulges in, and you try to paper over big bulges, you know. We had all the neighbours moving in. Everybody moved on, on the Carpenter's estate that were in the houses. They nearly all, some, some didn't, some moved away, but the majority of people moved into the flats and houses. Nearly all of us. So in here, we knew everybody. You had a bar, and... Apparently, the drinks were cheaper there as well, you know, so that did quite a trade. When I walk down the road, it's as though um, I'm a teenager again. And if Elsie is here and Greeny, another two that used to live on the estate, we do say, you know, remember when it was like this, the shops and, or so-and-so? Do you remember that lady who had that shop there? Or do you remember the little co-op? It's often in my mind what it was like because it was lovely. Well, it is my life. My life has been spent. It's where I played. Um, it's where I got hurt, <laughs> falling over. My courting. I mean, I went out with boys on this estate. Um, so it was all, it, my life has been this estate. So I'm not sure if you managed to actually hear probably because the video is really low in volume. But in terms of what was she saying basically is that considering the poor condition that she, she was before, actually living in one of those flats was literally a luxury. So they came from houses in which, um, in which basically they didn't even have a sink in the kitchen and uh, they would have to cook everything in the bathroom and use that sink for like washing themselves and uh, cooking. Also, you know, having the possibility to build this community from scratch then kind of made them have to build a community and try to help each other. So we tried um, to actually look for pictures of people in those times, like together, and picture of the community. We will talk about later about the archives, but in this case, we found this group on Facebook. Yeah, the, the, this, yeah, I uh, yeah, the Carpenter Estate, they have a um, group on Facebook. Um, they are sharing pictures and memories, memories and now of the community. And so we're trying to contact all of these people from, the, um, from this group and trying to find nice pictures to actually be able to work with. And unfortunately, we send it like, I don't know how many messages, 60, 70 messages, trying to contact all of these people, but 
we receive like a two answers and also we're trying to take loads of because there is like lots of nice pictures but yeah. unfortunately we couldn't use it because it was really poor quality so yeah we we, we didn't manage to to find much people and much images from from the group yeah unfortunately we try our best uh, we found like really beautiful picture a portrait of uh, residents this is actually a picture of uh, Alexander McQueen with his mother. He used to live there um, when he was young, till he was like around 13, 14. And he still has uh, family members living in the area. This is a picture of the children playing in the street. This is one of my favorites. Yeah, so good picture. <laughs> and yeah, so it was, we are so disappointed that we cannot yeah. use it. Because, and this as well. This is really, well, really nice. so beautiful. This actually is the, um, it was a grocery store and now that currently is off license and it's the only basically off license in the whole area there in Carpenter Estate is the only place that you can buy some grocery. Me and Domi spent a lot of time in Carpenter Estate and we were just eating some rubbish food in there. <laughs> so now back to uh, the present that explains a bit more what happened? So in uh, early 2000, um, the council decided that the area needed to be regenerated. So what they did was basically started to become people from the area and empty basically majority of the state. Um, and uh, after this process was done, they decided it was too expensive to regenerate the area. So instead of, you know, considering other things, they decided to actually demolish the area and uh, build the UCL campus in there. Now, few people were remaining because actually they bought the, um, the flat with the Margaret Thatcher, the Thatcher um, amendment. So they were still standing there and they were like, no, we're not gonna actually give up our house and our community to have like a new shiny um, um, university. So they actually tried everything that they could to actually fight um, this new change. And uh, what happened is a group of UCL students actually joined the protest with the residents because they understood what was at stake. And uh, they decided to protest. The protest was big, it was uh, people in the street, uh, people actually fighting for their places, uh, different strikes, to the point that UCL decided at that point that it wasn't worth it, it was the, the, the situation was too problematic. So basically the plan just uh, uh, didn't go through. From that moment, um, here by here, the councils have always tried to come up with a new regeneration plan. And, uh, you know, we'll explain later that to, till today, actually, people have been fighting off this, succeeding for the past 15 years. Now, this is a, a couple of images will be put just to, just to make you understand how little the government has done for those people. So th this is a picture of London Stadium, that, as you see it now, when it was built in 2012. Um, and on the left side is the fridge mountain, which was exactly in the same spot. So what it, this is, is literally a fridge dump. Um, everything, every fridge that was broken was actually put in there. Children used to play in there. Um, sometimes they used to get stuck because at those yeah, time, there was no button to press from the inside. So if you close it, you just basically get stuck inside. So there has been actually a couple of accidents and the resident told about this. So this image explains really well that basically before the Olympics, there was nothing was done for those people that were living in this community. So they were just left with like unbearable situation like this also. Uh, just because of the Olympics, uh, the government spent billions to actually bonify the area, which means they had to clean the soil from radioactive um, parts that were left from before and during the Second World War. Uh -huh. And the same for the canal. The canal was highly polluted, and still people would go there with the canal and just, you know, just go. It was really different, than actually, it looks like now. And this was done only because of the Olympics, and only because the Olympics would have basically brought into the area a completely different kind of people with money, and just the whole thought was about prof profitability, basically. This basically 
is a picture of when the um, empty houses had been occupied by a group of mothers, which formed just before after the Olympics. Is uh, they call their group uh, Foku 15. So what they've done basically is still fighting against the demolition and occupying all the empty flats because when they actually started to evacuate those, those, uh, those houses, the council said that they were not actually, it was not possible to live in there because there were ghost flies. We still don't know what ghost flies are. We never, we never understood what they are. Um, so they would say, okay, you can't be there, but those people went inside the houses and actually saw that the houses are perfectly fine. They can actually be occupied. Mm -hmm. Family can, be, can live there. So the whole, the whole estate was left empty just for no reason, just waiting to be, to be demolished. Now we're going to show you another video so you can actually see um, those people walking. <laughs> The skyline of London is changing and evolving at absolutely extraordinary speed. It is like an accelerated David Attenborough nature film about the return of spring to the Canadian tundra. Wonderful structures are going up. All prices across London have gone up by 20% in the last year. The result is that we face a colossal demand for homes, homes that are affordable for all Londoners. Regeneration means money for the fat cats. That's what it means. The original dream of council houses was to build homes for heroes, moving the working classes out of overcrowded slums and into revolutionary architecture, offering running water and futuristic streets in the sky. When we come in, I took it in a minute when I was looking out there and see all that green. Oh, I thought, ain't it lovely? Well, over night time, it's just like, exactly like fairy tale. But today, the post-war dream of urban renewal has turned sour. The number of council houses in London has fallen by a third in the last 20 years, despite a million more people living here. We don't have enough homes, full stop, right across the entire economy. That affects everyone. There's a real pinch point with affordability, and we certainly don't have enough affordable homes. The council estates we do have are gradually being emptied. People are being forced out by local councils to allow for redevelopment of the land. The highest bidders are winning, but the people are fighting back. All they give a shit about is making fucking money. In recent months, a group of London mums have started a campaign for truly affordable housing. Their campaign has caught the imagination of the media and public alike, and has sparked fires all across the city. One of the areas undergoing a lot of regeneration at the moment is East London. The borough of Newham has a housing waiting list of over 16,000 people. The council have said that because the refurbishment is too expensive, the estate is no longer viable and they are currently seeking a partner to help finance the regeneration. In the meantime, people are being rehoused in temporary accommodation where waiting lists are long, or they're moved into towns far away from London. In 2013, my mum, sister and I were evicted from our family home of 13 years. We had to declare ourselves statutory homeless and then move into temporary accommodation where we were waiting for a year. It was a really, really tough time being told that you had to wait in order to have somewhere to live. So when I see lots and lots of empty homes like this going unlived in, it really, really strikes a chord with me. I'm standing on the 22nd floor of one of the tower blocks on the Carpenters Estate in Stratford. It's only up here that you can see why it's become such a prime real estate. We've got Westfield Shopping Centre, we've got 10 train lines, so insanely good transport links, and then round the corner is the Olympic site. And if you come through here, this is what's happened to the flat. I think like 2006 families started being lived out and now it's pretty much like desolate and this is just an example of what's happening on every single floor. It actually could be the homes of 134 families but currently there's only 31 flats being used, all the rest are just like 
locked up. If you look through the keyhole, you can see that through the big window, directly opposite, an amazing view of the Olympic Park. There's all mats down as well, carpet. These aren't empty shells. This was someone's home. You know, so there's been a family that have chosen that carpet, they've chosen the wallpaper and they've made a home. Chris, if you come and see this Just Gone shop, won't be long, 12th of the 1st, 2006. That's a long time that these flats have been empty. Just seems such a shame when we hear from politicians and uh, newspapers that we're in the midst of a housing crisis and just aren't enough homes that there are all these flats on numerous floors that are going unlived in. This video was designed for a Chinese expo in 2010, offering up 1,000 hectares of new land as an investment opportunity. It's interesting, isn't it, seeing the amount of luxury home development. The developers who are building them make the biggest profit. From a local government point of view, if it's on land that they own, that's the way that they get the biggest capital receipt. And local authorities in London, as everywhere else in the country, are under huge financial pressure, it's not a surprise that they want to make the best use of the assets. I do think it's short-sighted though. We need good economic mix. London cannot afford to export the majority of its people and become an enclave for the wealthy. It will not function if that's the case. I'm about to meet the Focus E15 monks who have politically occupied one of the houses on Carpenter's estate to try and draw national attention to the issue. The Focus E15 campaigners had set the occupation up like a social centre to put the community back into the ghost town. Sir Robin Wells has been cast as the villain in the Mums campaign. Sir Robin Wells has said that the properties are not fit for housing. However, Newham, like other councils, have increasing power under the Localism Act to take advantage of the rising land value in their borough. Outside, I met Jamie, who had gone through her own housing struggles and had come down to show support. Yeah. So who do you think London's for now? Everybody, everybody. As I say, don't close the doors, man. Everybody's welcome. I'm not gonna hate anybody because they have wealth. There's no problem with anybody coming here. Just don't push me out. There is enough space for everybody, it's evident, like... All, all the empty flats. All the empty flats. If, if you can build high-rises, you can build more. Just build more that I can live in, that I can afford. I'm not saying don't cater for people that are going to come here and invest in the place. I'm just saying, please don't make me leave. Or, no, do you know what? No please anymore. I'm not going. Soz. <laughs> Soz. So after opening up, this property about a week and a half ago they found out that the properties were obviously completely habitable and now they've put this sign up which is council homes available and call robin wells that's his number jasmine stone is one of the focus e15 mothers leading the occupation she's been campaigning for council housing ever since she was evicted from temporary accommodation last year where did the idea for the campaign come from? Like, this, this is going to be a social centre, it's like the centre of Carpenter's estate. Well, and there's so many people that are being forced out of London to places like Manchester, Hastings and Birmingham. So, um, we thought we would highlight the issue of there being so many homes boarded up for years on end. Some of the properties on this estate have been empty for over eight years. This would have been a one-bedroom flat. This would have been the first bedroom. This is crazy. This would have been the living room. The wallpaper would have been here, the carpet and the rug were here, and we put in the furniture. After we'd lived in a hostel and they gave us a flat, this is like better than yeah, when we first moved in. So you've got ideal view here. Yeah, this is in the shadow of the Olympic Park. It's obvious what's happening. Like they're trying to demolish everything, and if you have a look around, you see all these big, giant glass buildings mm -hmm. that nobody can afford in the local area. Occupation. We were actually told by the council that we prevented them putting people in here. They've been empty for eight years, and apparently, we were the ones that stopped them over the last two weeks. It's basically just saying that 
your land is worth more than you? Yeah, exactly. There's people that have created memories here and they've given birth to their children and these homes are people's lives. But by taking someone's home away from them, they're taking their life away. The mothers weren't the only ones wanting to stay in London. 15-year-old Saffron had also joined the fight back. No 15 or 14-year-old should actually think, fuck, we're getting moved out of London. They should be going to school, they should be playing with their friends and doing what they want. Where the hell am I going to be put? Am I going to be living on the street? Am I going to be in a care home? No one wants to live in a council property. Absolutely no one. But if that's all you're given, then that's what you're going to make home. And to take it away from someone, that's not fair. This campaign, there was something so new and so fresh about it. First of all, they've shown that there are homes, people just need to be put in them. Then they've wiped away the excuse of Robin Wells, who said that they were unlivable, because if you look around, people could make a home there. In a situation when you do feel desperate and alone, these mums represent something really, really inspiring and really, really exciting, because they're actually fighting back. Repopulate! The Repopulate! The occupation attracted the attention of two local councillors who decided to come down and show their face. Social rent is probably about 50%, half of market rents. There is 24,000 people in this borough, 300,000 households, who are in desperate housing need. And it's a huge number. It? It's a huge number. It's a big issue. Is there is a housing crisis in, in London, in this country, and it's an affordability crisis. If you've got money, you can find somewhere to live. If you haven't got money, you've got nowhere to live. If we we're going to get build homes that these you know, young people and their children want and deserve um, at a price they can afford, well, somebody's going to have to pay for that. The wider problem is recycling. When, when properties become vacant, getting them ready and getting the legal possibility for people to come in and, uh, and live there. After occupying the building for a week and a half, the Focus E15 mothers were handed an eviction notice from the council. Yeah, so basically this uh, Focus 15 is pretty much uh, still um, working. And uh, um, they've been protesting and trying to delay as much as possible all the um, plan of regeneration. So here. This lives on still today. The only 27 flats out of a total of 130 across the three tower blocks are empty. Me and Domi actually managed to um, get inside one of them. Yeah, it was so sad we to have this empty place and like abandoned so long time ago. And we found lots of surprise in there. So dead animals, like you can see, that was actually, and no, no one lived there for so long time. And actually, you can, the people can, can live there, that just regenerate the place, and that's it. Like, it's accessible. The people can live that, but... Yeah, there's, they to leave that. there's still strong buildings. Yeah, so we is. went inside, and literally all they need is a bit of maintenance. It's everything there. Like, it's all, also the balcony. It's like a big room. Uh, is the kitchen and and bathroom, but it's empty. Yeah, the only thing that they did to uh, basically avoid for, to avoid people from squatting was to remove yeah. basically the water supply and the, basically the toilet so that no one can use it. But literally everything else was uh, was working. Now we have a, a picture actually. We wanted to show one of ours, but we decided to show this one instead, which is actually. Uh, Rapper is called uh, Funky D Hell, and he used to live in Denison Point. So we took the picture of the uh, album to show you actually what it looks like and when it's dark, and you can see yeah. now only four windows in. being uh, lighted up. And uh, today, actually, it's been a couple of years already. There is only one person living in Denison Point that is still standing in there. Now we're going to talk a bit about our experience and uh, what we found when we went there, because we actually didn't know what was affecting us. So we went there, and all we could see was literally nothing. Yeah. <laughs> like no literally, people, no one was there. No one there. We didn't know with who we have to speak. Like trying to find people around, but no one there. So we went there so many times, like visiting like how, like our second house. 
exactly. um, just to trying to involve people and trying to understand what we have to do and how we have to do it. And then also we looked uh, kind of armed because we were so excited at the beginning. We yeah, had like yeah. a shiny camera, super big lenses, so we were in there and oh, everyone yeah. was looking at us like, who oh, are those people? <laughs> so why are they here? So yeah. we, were like, we decided to do the interview. Oh yes, cool, we will sit with people. They will tell us about the community, how it is, and we will take a lot of pictures and then <laughs> we took so many pictures of buildings, it's hard to believe. Like, yeah. All the big <laughs> so buildings, many. like several times. And uh, we just go in the area, and majority of the people that actually pass in through the area, they didn't even leave mm. there. So at yeah. the beginning, it was yeah. quite tough to actually yeah. manage to um, build relationship. And then we'll explain also why. So as you can see, there is two people standing there. Yeah, in fact, here. we met um, one girl, um, but we, went, we wanted to do the picture to her uh, talent. Uh, but unfortunately, she couldn't say anything about the estates and the community because she was living there like a three years. So most of the people we were talking with, um, they they were there like a, for a few months or a few 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 years. So they couldn't say exactly. anything about. So they had been there just because they had been given like temporary accommodations. Yeah. And they were just passing through the. In fact, the they moved already. Exactly. So. When we actually found this place, yeah, <laughs> it was the only place with people. <laughs> so it was colorful, people painting. Uh, so we decided to go in and trying to understand what is going on and what is it. And it was actually like a community space when they were they we are creating events for the residents. Um, so we started to speak with people, trying to let them understand um, what we are doing and trying to be in and doing this event. So we did a few events and uh, the residents, they were walking around the state and the greenway that is close to the state. So they were showing their history and how it was looking like before and now and where they are going just to take a brief. Um, but then, when we met one girl, she yeah. was like really upset with us that we are here and she was really angry and she came to us and she said like, why are you here? Are here? Like, you, you, you are not allowed to be here. And then and we understood that there's something wrong with this place. So basically, <laughs> the place itself, which looks like a community space, is basically nothing else than uh, an organization that is basically bribing residents into all those activities. Yeah. But in reality, it's the popular living agency, which is the one in charge of the regeneration of the area. So when they saw us with our shiny camera, they were like, why are you here? Uh, you shouldn't be here. Um, then we explained the project. They were afraid that our project yeah. would be actually supporting um, the protest rather than and the regeneration. Community. So we were like, okay, so she didn't want us there at all. And we found out that all the people that actually were in, um, frequenting this place, they were actually the new ones, like the new residents, not the old residents. And so they were, of course, uh, participating in those activities. They, of they course, wanted to have like a few hour free childcare and painting yeah. and everything, but the, the real one, the real community, they, they were actually never stepping in there. They hated that and place. And they didn't even know what it is. Exactly, and they thought that we were with them. So they started to be like, you know, a few of them, they were like, no, we don't want to have nothing to do. We went to the off-license, tried to talk to them. They actually said, no, we don't want so nothing angry. to do with yeah. you. And reason being also because recently, through Popular Living Agency, there has been done a documentary which should have been, I mean, for the resident to talk about the problematic, but instead they put it in a different context and it was pro-regeneration. Yeah, so they didn't trust us. They thought that we actually are there to do the same thing. And we are part of the... the exactly. Regime. So it was uh, actually Excluded. months, yeah. months of going there back then also without taking pictures. So forget the, the taking pictures, forget to be creative, it's just going just to there understand what is going on. and create a kind of relationship. Like, yeah. hi, we are not here to abuse of you. We're trying to understand the situation. I mean, let, can you please tell us we're doing this? What do you like? What do you want in the war? And so it was months, months of yeah. going there. Till 
you know, we found this picture as well from uh, from archive. Like, yeah, we wanted really to use this picture uh, because it can be like a, a kind of mirror for what is going on and what is it the the community. But unfortunately, we couldn't use it because it's a really really political image. So we are, we we weren't allowed to put something like that on the wall. Exactly, because basically yeah. we thought it was actually describing the situation because it's a generational thing. So those are children, basically. So that the children and the house they actually, their parents own, this is supposed to then go to them. So the fact that they're actually putting children on the street protesting, it is an act like, you know, this is yeah. looking into the future, how this thing is going to affect in the future. And like, what's written in the flag. Social housing and not a social cleansing. So exactly. Yeah, so really we, strong and it's really strong and it's what's been happening in this place, but still we couldn't use it. So that's when we understood we are a bit limited here. Mm -hmm. So we can't take really part, like mm -hmm. one part, because one side we are or going another. Inside something yeah, so that. we were caught in the middle of trying to be yes, taking up the memory of the people, but at the same time, not those memories. So exactly. we were like, but the, those memories are what they made the community in the first place. So we were a bit like, mm. unhappy about this. Yeah. But yeah. still, we had to go through the project. So we decided then, since we are not from the area, we don't live in the area, we decided, okay, let's put it in a way in which is our, basically our journal, if it was our diary, basically. So basically yeah. going to the area, trying to research through archival images, <laughs> Two people much. understanding what they wanted, and then try to put our perspective. It was really difficult to understand exactly. what they wanted. Yes, because yeah. many of them, yeah. they wanted that side. Yeah, exactly. They wanted to talk all about that side. Yeah. So we had to find a way to make it like in a way that no one would be offended, even though all we were thinking is like, let's put those pictures on the wall, let's put yeah. the right picture yeah. on the wall. <laughs> but the problem was as well that uh, people doesn't understand the project, like, um, how it has to look like. We were trying to get as much images as we can from the people, but they were uh, sending us like a selfie from, or Instagram. from Instagram or from Facebook. So the, the quality was really, really poor. And it was re also really difficult to let, them, uh, let people understand that now we actually need something that is original, original photos that it has to be big picture. Exactly. Because so. I was like, okay, if we cannot have all of those residents participate, let's see if they have like uh, their own images that we can scan and then use like, you know, parents and whatever, family. But they were sending us those Instagram um, screenshots. Yeah, <laughs> that we actually cannot use it. So here we go. This is... Yeah, that's this one of loads of many, of many of the the draft that we did um, at the beginning had to be completely different. We were thinking about these huge images and things, but then we decided to do, like Luisa said, we decided to do our journal. It's like a, our sketchbook with all the images which we, we could do uh, with the residents and, um, and with archives pictures. So we decided to do double exposure because it was nice to think that we can put together the place and the people together in one image. And plus, we decided to do the, um, um, the archives picture as a Polaroid, just to have this kind of different differences between our picture and the picture from the past. So, and the idea of this, putting the images as a sketchbook um, really liked so we stuck yeah. with it and we thought about the text as well if we can yeah because we didn't want to basically just say what we want to say it was like okay if there is someone that needs to say something here anyway it needs to be the community so we put like yeah. quotes of people what they were saying the one that decided to participate to the project um, this is the basically the base image so we went to land point and uh, my idea was to take one old image but was impossible because with the wide lens you couldn't take the whole thing and it was all warped. So I had to take like several images and then put it into Photoshop and create a panoramic. 
We were really happy about the pigeon on the right, by the way. Yeah. Like, it was like, I w we need to keep the pigeon in there. Yes, we did. yeah. <laughs> and the other thing about the image from the um, from 23rd floor, it was so difficult to access in, the, in this building. We were um, asking every week to for the access for too many people, mm -hmm. and it takes us like a four months just yeah. to go there because the first idea was to put, because okay, we cannot go there, so we have to invent something. So we told that we can do like a map as a background and then the picture on, but then it was, good, it was really good uh, yeah, we did that, that we did it. We tried yeah. to bribe the security guards actually with coffee, but it didn't work. <laughs> so we were like, no way, go away. <laughs> so now we're gonna show you a couple of um, double exposure that we actually put this many more, but we just, a couple of them. Uh, this is the pub. Yeah, uh, like which, a mixed pub and the place. And the place, and we have the family. We, we have the family, that's this family. Unfortunately, uh, they, they were really, really nice people, and we took lots of images of yeah, them. It was, it was at the <laughs> point that we still didn't have any, any more residents, so it was like, it looks like a memorial of them. Yeah, okay. Because there's so them. many pictures of them, and now yeah. we're gonna be like, okay, maybe not. Because they, they were only available for it. And yeah. then we found another resident, that is Vanessa Hobby, that actually she is resident from a long time of the Carpet and Stairs, and she did the um, um, Facebook page on Carpet and Carpet is Memories, and Part, and Memories and Now. Um, so she was available actually to take the picture and let us understand how the Daria was before as well. They had, they had like a pub uh, and dancing place. Exactly. It was, uh, it was very different than what yeah, we found basically. So we have another couple of them. The pigeon. Always. They were always there. They were always there. <laughs> So archival images, so considering that we couldn't use the picture that we found on the Facebook or any other online platform um, due to the resolution, we spent hours in the new archives trying to find material to use in our war. Now, when I say hours, I mean really long hours because majority of the material is not really cataloged properly, so you need to actually look at like many books to try to understand is this the area you know, it's, you don't go, want to go too far from the area because yeah. otherwise you're going to represent another Something kind of else. community. So we used only the one that we actually we were certain they were from the area. And there was many more, but there was still like, okay, how close is this place? Plus, there was few that were literally in really poor conditions. Mm -hmm. Even they tried their best to actually preserve them. Still, when they got them, they were actually kind of ruined. It was really interesting to be there. And I didn't expect... To, that we got, uh, got so passionate about it. It was like, <laughs> look at this, look at this other thing. Oh my God, like, <laughs> beautiful. So we're gonna show you a bit. Oh, the Paris pictures, yeah. So this is Berger Paints, the old factory. This is how it's used to look like. You can see the three blocks. tower blocks. This was one of my favorite. It was yeah. really nice. You see like people just painting gnomes. This was a, a perfumery place, which was much smaller than New Yardley, but still we couldn't get the front. Yeah. So we don't know how the front looks like. This is what we had to work with. Uh, this, this is, is amazing. Awesome. Well. Yeah. Please don't litter your streets. <laughs> and this the is factory. women working in the Yardley factory, actually. This, we really thought to have this one. Yeah. Like literally we were looking for it all over the place and we finally and this got it. Really, really important picture. Yeah. yeah. This is yes, a picture it already, the yard image. So we used it. It was, it, it was important. This is actually High Street. Um, again, we saw, we saw it before. Now here, so while we were there spending lots of hours and days and months doing this uh, uh, wall, in the meantime, starting in September, uh, a ballot took place, which should have been the final ballot to understand what is going to happen to this estate. Now, the ballot started in September, and at the same time, the focus it in was having a campaign to actually make sure that people would vote no to the demolition. Now, 
just before we had to finish our war, I received re we received really bad uh, news that the people, they are actually on the wall. They are not agreeing anymore to be on the wall. Because, because the ballot, of the ballot. The ballot turned out and to be yeah. yes for the demolition. They couldn't, they couldn't trust us. They told that we are part of the hotel and we, they are against the council. So actually, we were like, okay, the wall is going to be printed right now. And uh, you are telling me that you don't want to be on the world anymore, so we we're just like crying, okay, what's it gonna do? So we had to meet these people again and trying to let them understand that we are not uh, against them. It's nothing to be with, uh, with the devotee. Um, just crying in front of them because if we will take all of the pictures from the resident, like it will be just, just, just the place just and the, place. the buildings and anything else. So unfortunately we could we managed to convince two people, but unfortunately, other two people, we had to take it off from the wall because they weren't yeah. there anymore. And the reason was exactly, so the ballot ended up to yes to the demolition, but it wasn't a democratic ballot for the simple fact that the majority of the people that voted yes for the demolition, they were exactly the people that have been living in there for a really small amount of time, and they didn't really care about what's gonna happen in the, in the state. At the same time, it's like, okay, if I am going to be promised a house for my children in 20 years' time, of course I'm going to take it. Without considering that actually, if you look at the contract, it's not even guaranteed 10% of social housing when they're going to actually build those shining new flats. And uh, it kind of, since the, now the demolition is actually uh, going to happen, it kind of concludes like a kind of generational circle because it was like... Uh, you know, community being destroyed to build those flats, and then community being destroyed to demolish them and build something new. So it's literally a complete circle of basically just governments manipulating people yeah. into whatever is more profitable for them. And they, they, they were feeling like that with our wall as well, because, okay, you are, you are demolished everything, and you are giving me what, like a piece of my memories, exactly. uh, but, just the, the area will not be there anymore. So yeah, like it felt a bit like a joke. Like yeah. you know, why would I even be here if you're giving us a wall when we know that yeah. from March we're gonna be basically sent away and uh, the place is gonna be destroyed. Yeah. So we knew there was a tough. And tough this, thing. this Vanessa Hubi, she was thinking about to be on the wall or not because oh yeah, I don't I don't deserve to be on the wall because I would prefer the other people. Um, I would prefer all the people to be there, and now what is happen what, what happened? So, um, so yeah, it, it was so so difficult to, to manage with people because they were yes, no, yes, no. Exactly. So our outcome. We're going to show you a couple of pictures on actually how the work turned out to be. So this is the day that finally it was put up. Actually, we had uh, because of COVID. We also had the project, um, the final day of um, basically delayed by a month. Finally, we managed to put it up. This is the yes, pictures. Yes. So they're here covering because the idea is was of the, of the day, uh, people of the, I mean, of the community should be uncovering it as a surprise, basically. This is when they do it. This is the on the left the new mayor of um, Newham yeah. being there with few children. And this is the picture. Oh, <laughs> not really satisfied because we knew that not many people will come for the event because they were really angry and they didn't want to have anything with, with this wall. So yeah, and the other thing that we couldn't say anything about because we were like in the middle, there is a uh, mayor of uh, Newham and us and the project and people getting them, they lost their case, so we were just there and... Yeah, just yeah. to be like diplomatic, <laughs> reality, really diplomatic. all we wanted to say, it was like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> We don't want to have this wall anymore. Just take it off. <laughs> yeah, at the beginning it was different because we didn't yeah. know all, uh, all of the, about the stuff. So, but after all, after the story, after what happened, after the people, speaking with people as well, understanding mm -hmm. that 
they, 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 don't, they will not have any more their houses. So yeah. it was like, oh my God. Exactly. If we knew that actually the place, the old place would be demolished, we wouldn't yeah. have done it. Yeah. Or we would have, would have done something really different, but at the same time, when you're working commissioned by someone else, you can't just you know, do whatever you want. You need to, at the same time, understand what they're asking and work yeah. with them. This is the new and uh, major talk, and she was actually really nervous, and she was carefully in trying to say things that wouldn't upset. She didn't know what to say. Yeah, she really didn't know what to say, actually. She just said, many woes to come, and mm. we were like, what does it mean? You want to have more regeneration plans, exactly. where? <laughs> and we met the resident, and he saw the new Ham logo on the bottom, so he was like, oh, you are not, you, you are, are in the, the wrong, the wrong side. side. You are on the wrong side. This is uh, T, nice. actually, one of the residents that you saw in the picture, they actually managed to be in our project, and she actually spoke uh, some really kind words, saying that even though the situation was difficult, we tried our best to get in, and just work around the whole problem as sensitively as possible, basically. To be very outside. Yeah. Around. Those are some close up of uh, our Let's work. Switch to people. Yeah. Some children playing on playing. the uh, there is They expanded like. and they started to draw on the houses. <laughs> and this is it. <laughs> So, you know, the biggest support of the day. So as soon as we saw them, we were like, okay. we need to tell you the truth, how we feel. We are not happy. Please and listen to it? us. Yeah. It was like a really, really, really big We don't big know help. what to say. <laughs> we have to be polite. <laughs> we don't want to be polite. And last bit. So talking about what we learned. So working as a team, I personally before this, uh, if I could work by myself, I would have done it. Yeah. I really like it. never worked <laughs> as a team. But this actually told me that it is possible. You can yeah. work as a team if you find the right people. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, we were meeting like almost every day. Um, we became like our sisters, um, working on it. So finding the, the, the time to work together and trying to like, it's really nice that we are completely different and we are working in a different way. So putting these skills together was really nice as well and teaches I think a lot. A lot, a lot. Then social engagement, to have the courage to go out there asking the same people the same thing, even if they say, they say the same answer. She was yeah. no and still trying again and again and understanding the problem and trying to be sensitive and understanding, even when they refuse to be on the wall, try still to be understanding and be like, you know, they are right, but at the same time we did the work. So it was a difficult situation, but actually we learned a lot in this experience yeah. about community engagement. Well, like somehow because, you know, you yeah. have to send lots of messages and you have to speak with those people again and again. Again and again, and like again literally again. for calling us can you explain me the project again? Yeah. I don't know if I want to be there anymore. Can you please explain it again? Yeah. Like while we work in starting. Yeah, of course I can. Like, no worries, we're right here. Exactly. Yeah. Leave really a good aspect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the, the most important thing is to have your certification and permission that the people want to be there and trying to, uh, trying to let them sign straight away. <laughs> And maybe not waiting because who because it's difficult sometimes to um, remeet with those people again because if not at the end the people changing their minds yeah, uh, in the meantime can happen lots of of different situations so model I think permission we learn, model yeah, release form model release that form. is the really big yeah, legal no. part that is it needs to be followed if not. It's yeah, we had actually, really, the problem was that many of those people, they didn't sign straight away because either they couldn't or we were working, and then at the end, they literally changed their mind, yeah. and we didn't have anything to actually prove unless it was text messages, which is nothing, it's nothing. basically. So yeah, so, if they yeah. want to go to the court because they are on the wall, <laughs> they, they can do that. Yeah, we were terrified. Yeah. So printing and softwares, that was uh, amazing because at the, at the beginning we did the project um, in Photoshop, 
and we were like, okay, working with a huge file, it was 15 gigabytes. The computer started crashing like several times. It Fairly wasn't working, it was a nightmare. <laughs> but at the end, when we actually went there for the first test print, the guy was like, the printer was like, yeah, you worked on Photoshop, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, it's not gonna come out really well. And I was like, what do you mean? You knew that I was working on Photoshop. I was now now Illustrator is much better. It's so we had to writing. redo it again in Illustrator and actually learn how to use Illustrator like from scratch. Yeah, the, and, the, the uh, nice thing was like she's studying photography, I'm studying graphic design. Yeah. He was doing graphic design, I was doing photography. It, so exactly, so we <laughs> just swapped <laughs> the whole situation and then Last bit, uh, flexibility and adaptability. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why? Like finding, like we, we have much, many things to do uh, at the same time, but at the same time we had to finish this work. So uh, spending 24 hours on 24 hours and smoking cigarettes. And Super stressed. Yeah, be there, be there, <laughs> trying to finish. Like um, it, her computer crashed. In oh, one, some so point. many times. And we lost the work ones. We yeah. lost the old work ones. Because when we were saving it, we merged the file, it merged it, and then it saved it after merging it. So you only had one layer. So you had to redo it again from scratch. Yeah. And like a 15 gigabytes of, of, exactly. of file and canceling all the other apps of the, uh, the software from the computer. But the most important thing was in terms of adaptability is you're working for someone that not necessarily is gonna like your work. Yeah. So the first time that we actually had the first draft, they looked at it and they were like, yeah, maybe we're gonna change some change, things. Change, change, and then change. they changed everything. Like literally everything. At the beginning, we were really upset. We we're like, I don't like that color. Yeah. I don't want the yellow <laughs> color in there. It was like, for us, it was like a huge shock because it was really personal. So by doing so many changes, when I mean changes, I put just a section of school screenshot there of how many times. I have like many more files, uh, changed files. It means that every Same. single time that we were showing them the file, they were like, put that on the left. Yeah, that a little corner. bit on the we right. Don't like that color. A little bit on the right. <laughs> so it was such a nightmare, but at the same time we learned like, yeah, this is a good lesson for the future yeah. when you're gonna work for, an, for a client that is not gonna like your purpose right away. And you still have to be detached enough so, so, so many to times. actually do it. Like so, archives picture we changed like from the writing, sending from the writing to the moving, Everything. the was, text, like so many times and saving the same file as that. Okay, this is good, good one, good two, good three, good five. Yeah, so, but yeah. it is important. At the really end, when they were asking um, the change it, we were not feeling attacked anymore. So yeah. like after months, we're like, okay, this is, we have to do it. Yeah. So it's not personal yeah. anymore, yeah, let's do it. it, and that's it. So. Yeah. And the last was to never give up because we were the only one doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and actually we managed to do it. Yeah, we, we managed to finish it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. Never give up, like all of this, so many th things happened in the meantime and actually we are there, okay, let's do it. Let's go ahead, yeah, let's finish. <laughs> and yeah, we finished. Yes, we did. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, very many congratulations from all of us for managing to, you know, um, what sounded like a really complicated process, complex process, and negotiating with so many different parts, right? So may I ask if the person who was asking for the changes was the um, arts organization that you were collaborating yeah. with? Yeah. yeah. So you would never been um, in touch with the council itself, right? You would always work with that. Yeah. Brilliant. And the summary of the film. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions, comments? Yes. Hi, Louisa. How are you? Hello, all oh, good. So, my question is you look for the wall, your final idea for the wall. Is it your idea, or did the organization chose to ask you to put certain pictures in certain areas? Well, like, the wall is our idea, yeah. but they have to basically, you know, give their own input too. So what they did was changing colors of uh, the text, moving some pictures around, yeah. but it happened a lot. Like so, it was constantly happening. 
So that is the, the changes. Yeah. So basically Otherwise, you gave the idea and they yeah. have the final yeah, yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, we show them their final project. They like that, but they were not happy. They wanted something more punchy. The colors were different. We were like using pastel colors. They okay. wanted something actually, you know, at the end of the, even the yellow that we didn't like, now we got no, a costume okay. to it, yeah. so it's and, fine. I mean, and, and we had another problem because we decided to do some pictures just because it's beautiful to do the double exposure with the analog camera. And there you have to think about this picture will be big. So yeah. uh, you have to manage to have really good high resolution. So we, we couldn't, for this example, for the digital images, uh, we couldn't put like a digital really big and the analog exactly. really small. So we have so to scale to everything down, even though, yeah, we would have preferred to have the picture much bigger, but the problem when you're putting all the files really into easy. one file, you're scaling, it's a seven meter wall, you're scaling it to 70 centimeters. So all the pictures that are put in there, they're scaled down to 5% of the original size. Yeah. So when you're blowing them up, you actually, you can't uh, enlarge them much more than they actually are. Otherwise it would be like in, grainy and everything. In fact, when we saw the first um, print, oh my the, God, that was it terrible. was, we had a nice cut, the picture of the cut. And she was like, no, it's not, it's not gonna work this. It was looking like a painting. It was so Because they were trying to adjust all of the noise. Yeah, it was So terrible. it was looking like, like this, this is gonna abstract be, painting. And that is gonna be for three years after the wall? No way. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Hi, Louisa. Hi, Hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, well, first I wanted to say congratulations. I unfortunately couldn't come to the opening. I was busy, I was shooting, but I went the next Sunday with my client. She was amazed by the work you did, and I just wanted to say that she was also congratulating both of you. Thank you. As I explained what was happening in the Carpenter Estate, because thanks to you, I got, you know, because of that trip that we did last year with Antigone, you explained to us what was happening in the area. Thanks to that, I was able to also get some other people to go see the wall, and hopefully they will go and tell me about it. I want to hear you know, more about it. And I also wanted to ask, uh, how many times did you need to resize the picture? Yeah, and uh, do you think that you can call you know, the mural that you did a collage? Because if you think about it, by putting yeah. the pictures, you know. It is a digital collage in the yeah. end, um, more like a digital sketchbook, mm -hmm. like uh, in terms of collages, because yeah. we wanted to give it context in terms of having the background, you know, the background means the big picture of the state, that state is not gonna exist anymore. So we wanted like the main base to be like big, big size so that people can see it and kind of remember how the skyline used to look like because it's going to be destroyed, it's gonna leave a, a memory a gap in there for people. That place is not gonna be there anymore. And uh, we have it in our camera, at least. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Well, hi, Louisa. Congratulations, and congratulations to you, too. Um, my question is, I've, um, looking at the world, the pictures are very beautiful there. I want to find out if you intend making a book of it or something. Yeah, well, we are going to have an exhibition for sure, for starter, and uh, let's see if in the future we want to have a book. Also, this experience made us look like made us look at London in a different way. So we are looking up now at different buildings because the, the, what's happening in Carpenter Estate is happening everywhere around yeah. London. For all the buildings that are not listed, like first listing or second listing, they are actually marked for demolition. So it would be nice then eventually to actually talk about Carpenter Estate, but then kind of connect it to the other communities as well. So I have a more variety of actually, you know, picture and stories. So that would be in the future something, uh, something to do. But for starters, we're going to have an exhibition. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of I mean, I want to follow up from what Ron was just saying, because you talked about um, your research into the archives in Yom and how difficult it's been for you to trace the material and make sense, because possibly, as you said, they were listed underneath all sorts of different things, all those images, right? 
But to what extent your images are archival or will become archival in the future? It is very sad that it's going to be demolished, right? So you probably are some of the very few photographers and artists and graphic designers who've been around and did the project right before its demolition. Yeah. Um, and so have you thought of your own work or your own images uh, having a sort of archival value in the future? Yeah, they will. Yeah. Yeah, we have so lot, many pictures, of so many pictures <laughs> of different people. Different Bangladesh of different the buildings. Angles, <laughs> yes, like we have a huge, a huge amount of pictures. I think you really need to think of way of labeling it and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all those kind of like creating a, a comprehensive archive because, you know, you say if we revisit that in 10 years time, I don't know when people will be looking for those stories again yeah, or whatever. Yeah. You'll be like, oh, what was that? When did we do it? Like, yeah, don't rely on your memories, trying to find a good way of, you know, labeling them and treating them as a personal archive. Yeah. Uh, Congratulations. I'm just incredible the amounts of work you, you've done. I'm just curious, uh, in terms of you two working together, and you said about having um, a team and, and trusting each other. I, I can't remember what the name of your organization LD. <laughs> LD. LD. Yes. LD. Yeah. Always LD. <laughs> no, I get it. So I get it. So so thinking about the future, do you when do you see this do you see yourselves working together and then possibly working with anybody else or is it how how tight is your crew? I think that by building the exhibition you know, it is that we are going to work together again. And I think that we can take it step by step and then see what it leads. But definitely, since we worked on a project, I don't see any reason why we cannot work in other projects in the future. So it worked. It did work. I think what is also extremely interesting is the fact that, you know, I've been, um, I've been teaching Louisa in a module this term and I've been asking her, oh, you know, all this material you've got will make such a great project for a global photography module. And she's like, I'm really fed up. I don't want to do anything else about it. And that was September. And here she is in February having future plans. I see many hands. I think I ought to go there first, then back to Adam and then back to... I wanted to see the picture with the four lights in the... Um, Which one? When you said there was like only a few people left. Oh. And you could see the, the building was empty. Mm -hmm. The album picture. Please. Yes, please. Album. <laughs> Where is it? Sorry. We need to go way back. Bear with us. Okay. This one. Yeah. Oh, you can listen to the old album. We did. We did. <laughs> <laughs> we listened to the old album trying to find, you know, some connection. There, were, there was like few songs that actually, you know, yeah, said like life and then at some yeah. point. I was but speaking all the area. We messaged him actually as well. You want to come up with you? <laughs> <laughs> it never replied though. <laughs> I, I, mine is not really a question, it's an observation. One of the things that I think you learned and that was really quite challenging for this particular project is diplomacy. I mean, you were seeing on one side of the fence and you were seeing on the other side of the fence and having to explain your situation to the community um, and win them over. I mean, I think every big socially engaged project requires you know, time and effort and sincerity and honesty and, and gaining people's trust. But I think you were thrown like three or four extra spanners into the yeah, works yeah. with these, you know, all these different dynamics that kept on changing also. So I congratulate you for that. I, I think um, a lot of people probably would have given up quite quickly. So, Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Well, actually, I... Well, one thing I've learned about that is discipline. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly, that was a good lesson. A yeah, good it lesson. was. Yeah, <laughs> we have learned lots, lots, lots from this one. Just uh, show up even when, when you don't want to. Just, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. go there and do it. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm sorry for coming in late, but I had, I had things to do. So, but it was interesting hearing the kind of end point of your project. Um, you mentioned the fact that you didn't work directly with the council, you worked directly with the arts organisation. What I want to know is, did the arts organisation work directly with the council, and did they share any information with you? Yes. That's helped you. So yes. it would be interesting to hear yeah. a bit more about that. Exactly. So that is yeah. the reason why when we show them the political image of the children, then they, they were angry. actually contacting the council and they said, this actually might raise the problem. So we didn't deal with the council, but they were, and then they would actually report back to us and uh, tell us what's happening, basically. Yeah. We just communicate with them, and yeah. then we're communicating with the council. Um, hi. Uh, hi. Congratulations again. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, so your, your experience from day one, your connection to the project or to the area, on day one and to, to the last day. So, because uh, as it's a very um, emotion, kind of an emotional project. Yeah. And so, uh, I guess I wanted to know what's your attachment to not just the project, but to the community now. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, we started the first day to be completely lost to the point that now we wouldn't want it to be on our own opening just because what we, happened. Oh, what happened. So we, and through what the we months, discovered, actually. Yeah, through the months, we actually got really attached, and we took our side, which would be the resident yeah. side. And exactly. uh, unfortunately, you know, we had to go on with the project and everything, but... We didn't know from the beginning. It was, like, completely different at the beginning and the end, and our emotions changed as well through the project, through the development. And we there were there every day, and just yeah. by thinking this place is not going to exist anymore, yeah, it's... Exactly. Uh, and you speaking know. as well with the residents, they were really angry and, and telling us what was happening, why they are really sad about all of this stuff. So also the wall is like, I'm not going anyway. Uh, the community is not there anymore. Like it's not how it was before. Like everyone was looking after another resident. So it's so, nothing exists anymore. Yeah, we definitely got attached, definitely. Yeah, my question is, um, so congratulations for finishing, because I know how hard it was. But do you think you got there, maybe it was there too late to do this project? Excuse me? It was too late to do this project in the making before uh, late, saving it. Late or not late, unfortunately, you need to work on what we have. Yeah. And it's uh, I think COVID it was. wise. COVID wise, actually, the problem is that we should have actually launched the project in September. But, but it was we impossible. Did, yeah, it was impossible because of COVID. So it was delayed, then the print. So it was like a literal few situation. It, so it wasn't just for this. We didn't have much, not that much materials, but the people yeah. that wanted to be involved in it. Like we couldn't put on the wall just what is there, like the area picture and that's it. Like we needed someone and it was so difficult to find with those people. And for this reason, yeah. it went the wall when it went. But also, if you think about it, okay, if we actually managed for some reason to launch it before the ballot, yes, we would have a massive party. Sure. Amazing. Yeah. But then it doesn't change the result. Exactly. So the result is still at the place. It's not going to be there anymore. So either way, whether it's late or not. Yeah, we, yeah, we just couldn't have more people maybe, yeah. but that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. But we, 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 if, if it was like that, we couldn't uh, understand and learn that yeah. much from the community as well, exactly. from the project. It would have been much superficial, be before. much more superficial, yeah. for sure. Very great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I guess the other thing that is very interesting about timing, to follow up from the question, is that um, the, the, the community struggle has been going really strong since the Olympics, right? So you exactly. wouldn't know when and if there's going to be a turn of events, right? Up until now, they've been holding on nicely together, and as you said, some of them still live there. So you, would, you couldn't possibly predict, could you, that that's no, no. going to be the end? I mean, they fought UCL and this whole thing, which was, you know, quite big. So. It's interesting, well, interesting, I don't know, but you know, you wouldn't ever imagine that this is the end of it. When you started, I was thinking, yeah, we're gonna be right in the middle of that struggle, it's gonna be really fascinating. I mean, it still is, but for different reasons, I suppose. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Are there any final questions? Yes. So we take you, and I think we're going to finish it here. Yeah. Hello again. Hello. Uh, one more question. Since you are involved with the people who are living in the Gotham Fair stations, have have you ever got feedback from them about the wall or how you presented it to them? Or? So the few people actually actually remain in the wall, yes, and one of them was actually T. And uh, yes, I, I he liked the piece overall, of course. Everyone liked the one, the one that was there, but really liked it. But most important for us, actually, the recognition of the artwork that we did behind the scene, yeah. which was like literally going there, showing up all over again and trying to work with people. So we are happy about the artistic part, but we are even more happy of you know, like building those relationships and try to understand those people. So there's just uh, the feedback about the, play, about the art piece. It is nice, of course, but we kind of put it on the side to actually say like the feedback about how we did as people, basically, behaving with other people in this circumstance, which was, you know, you need to be pretty sensitive. We can, you can't just push yourself Oh yeah, today I'm going out to fight to take amazing pictures. Exactly. It didn't happen many times, but it was just a matter of, okay, let's understand those people truly because we'd never, never experienced that before. Yeah. I, can I can remember the lady, the resident from there, and she was looking at the wall and she was like almost crying, saying, okay, and reading all of the points. And she was like, Duh, yeah, but this community is not community anymore. It doesn't look like that anymore. It was, yes, a long time ago, but it's not more like that. Yeah. And in one side, it is nice to have those pictures and show them how it was looking the area before. But on the other side, it's really sad that it's not like that anymore. Exactly. So yeah. both, both uh, emotions involved. And one more thing, if it wasn't for the organization's decision at the end, and it was your choice, and you have the final say on print, how you want to show it, would you change the way it looks, or would you change the way you presented it to the people? We would have removed the new M logo. Obviously. Like 100%. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we would have put many more archival images, yeah. and overall, like, you and know, resident. images, resident. <laughs> They actually were more politically in the context, you know, like things that happened, more protesters, like literally the whole thing, we would have actually put it in there for sure. In fact, one of the residents actually said to us, if you want, I can give you another project, which is another wall, only for us, only for the residents. So and we were no like, new no new you can't send the new home. <laughs> and would you work together again, like in a project like this again? Sorry? Would you work together on a project like this on yeah. a different part of the land? We still want to understand how we're going to develop this. Um, obviously, we're going to have an uh, exhibition like in Stratford as well. And here? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, there is many other, uh, other things in London happening that are more or less on the same lines. So, yeah. And yeah. I would love to work with Luisa again. Yeah. It's a nice experience, <laughs> just because I'm a little bit mad and she's more. Uh, so it's like I'm putting together things. Like I was saying to her something like, okay, shall we do this and that? And she was like, no, just please don't go too much again. <laughs> Overboard. <laughs> At this point, I think we really have to thank Dominica and Luisa for inaugurating our new terms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here, and I hope that the videos were not too boring for you. We were really passionate about them, so hopefully, you know, you learned something too. And thank you. Thank you. Brilliant, guys. So let, let's just one, one more applause, because it's a, it's a pretty tall order. We, we, we told you, what, Friday to come up with the presentation, so it's a really quick turnaround. And for you guys, you've acted really professionally and put something together which has been really, really great and insightful. So yeah, one more uh, clap, please. Thank you. And so just, just before we finish as well, just to say next week, we've got something completely different. Um, 
We've got uh, an alumni of ours going to come back. He's gone off and started a music studio, and uh, they're going to come in um, with all their music gear and like produce a record, um, kind of a, hopefully like live on stage. So plenty of participation. So it should be uh, yeah a, a, a different kind of vibe for next week. So please um, yeah obviously come and uh, make sure all your classmates come. It's a compulsory event, and we're going to be installing the tap machine as well to. Uh, Kind of, you know, encourage you to, to come and uh, take part. But yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.